Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you both witnesses for your work in law enforcement. Um, um, our neighboring state of Wisconsin, Chief Lynn, uh, and also in Colorado, I think all three of our states share um, a common belief that uh, hunting and recreation is an important part of the culture of life in our states. It's certainly important in Minnesota. Uh, I have supported the Heller decision and was on the amicus brief uh, for the McDonald decision, but I thought you, Chief Lynn, um, did a good job of explaining how uh, still those decisions, uh, and you, uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, those decisions anticipated that there are reasonable rules and regulations, and it's our job in working with you to figure out what those are. Uh, and I think that's what this hearing is about. Um, the first thing that I think there's some agreement on is that felons shouldn't have guns, and you had a good discussion there with Senator Cornyn, so I'm not going to go into that as a former prosecutor. Uh, that was one of my top priorities, to enforce those laws, to work with the U.S. Attorney's Office. A second one uh, that is emerging is the problem with the background checks. I think most gun owners even agree uh, that we should have some kind of background checks. Uh, one of the problems right now is the uh, private sale loophole. Uh, one of the, the data from FBI shows that the number of women killed with a firearm by an intimate partner is 34% lower in states that have closed the private sale loophole than in states that do not regulate such sales. Uh, do you think that this would be helpful, Mr. Walsh, in domestic abuse cases to close that loophole? Uh, Senator, thank you. Thank you for the question. I guess your mic is off. Thank you. The, uh, Senator, thank you for the question. I, you know, one of the, the most uh, uh, effective and important elements of existing federal law is a provision that makes it uh, that prohibits people with domestic violence misdemeanor as well as felony convictions from owning a weapon. And the reason for that is that the statistics show that in in cases of particularly habitual domestic violence, uh, the presence of a gun in the home uh, can be deadly. Uh, and too many of those cases result in, in the death of the abused spouse or the abused intimate partner. Um, I One of the areas where uh, we need to have a, an invigorated uh, existing database and then an expanded database to cover uh, all sorts of private transactions is exactly that area. Because right now, all too often, those misdemeanor offenses may or may not show up accurately in the database, depending on how a state is reporting them, and we need to we need to tighten that up in many instances. We also need to make really strong efforts to ensure that that uh, habitual, particularly habitual domestic uh, violence offenders, aren't able to obtain a gun from a friend or through a straw purchase or things of that sort. And that's why tightening up and extending the background check to cover private transactions could be of great assistance. Um, another area I think most people would agree on would be the trafficking issues, and I'll submit some questions for that on the record, uh, but uh, there's difficulty for law enforcement to investigate and prosecute those who traffic firearms, and I think most people would agree uh, that's an area uh, where it would be reasonable uh, to make some regulations. Uh, we have uh, the issue of the mental health records and uh, juvenile, um, some of the juvenile issues. We actually in Minnesota had a guy that killed his parents. Uh, that up. This just happened last year's, uh, and they found him with a bunch of weapons uh, because there was an error in how the background checks were made and what was in the records and those kinds of things. Um, and he had actual notes um, about Newtown uh, when they found him uh, with those guns. And so uh, I just believe that more work can be done there, and there should be public support for that. Uh, my last question would be of you, uh, Chief Flynn. Uh, we've heard a lot of statistics thrown around about the effectiveness of the assault weapon ban. Uh, you've been in law enforcement for 40 years. Uh, what was your personal experience, and uh, did you observe a change when the law was first enacted in 1994 when it sunsetted in 2004? Well, thank you, Senator, for the question. Listen, you know, back in the years when I was in graduate school, I had to endure research and statistics classes. They made my hair hurt, but I didn't learn a thing or two. And one of the things I learned was the difference between correlation and causation. And what we have is a study in 2000, and, and, you know, the, 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 a study in 2007 that studied the Brady Bill. It clearly identified correlations. It couldn't identify causations. Why? Because it was written by PhDs. And PhDs can never decide anything. The fact of the matter is, during the life of the Brady Bill, the number of assault weapons used in violent crimes declined by two-thirds. Now, we didn't do a control study. We didn't do a study where we gave out AK-47s and then compare and contrast it with a state in which nobody had an AK-47. Then we'd know. Instead, we took a leap of faith. 
we made this assumption, bold as it was, that keeping high-capacity firearms with military-style weaponry out of the hands of criminals might reduce violence. And violence was reduced. Now, the police did a lot of things. We changed our strategies. We embraced community-oriented policing. We embraced, you know, accountability systems such as CompStat. We worked very hard. We worked closely with the DAs. We worked closely with the community. We put a lot of guys in jail. And we started recovering fewer assault rifles. But can I show a causation? No. Is there a correlation? Yes. And so it all depends how you want to spin the data. And that is a cottage industry all by itself. Thank you very much, Chief Flynn.